but the dozen or so of them together. He'd had to run at them with a stick, beating and swiping before they'd flown off, and not before Shinto had taken a nasty peck above one eye. He didn't like to think about what would have happened to the puppy had he not been there. He'd seen what the birds did to newborn lambs. And the nuns were not magpies, for all their outward appearance. He had no need to be afraid. Sure at last that no one was in the room immediately behind the door, he stepped inside, and the smell of the convent hit the back of his throat like smoke from a chemical fire. It was the smell of the caravans in which elderly women lived, the smell of the lavatory after his mother had spent some time in it, but also the smell of cooking food and the church of his childhood. The smell of the convent made him feel like a child again. He felt suddenly dizzy, as though the walls around him were growing, Alice in Wonderland style, getting taller, pushing the ceiling out of sight, as he shrunk in size. He was afraid to look up. On one formica worktop, a knife had been left. It was large, about seven inches long, used for cutting meat rather than fruit or vegetables. He picked it up and felt himself again. Chapter 102 When the balloon went down, when I knew that Jessica was dead and that man was looking for me, my first instinct was to come home. I swear to you, sisters, this is where I was coming. Past noon, the sun in the convent refectory was shining through the old flawed glass of the windows. Dust particles danced in the golden light. The smell of the meat stew and of cooking oil wafted around the room every time the door to the kitchen opened. Florentina had brought a vase of freshly cut roses in from the garden. When she thought no one was looking, she pushed it fractionally closer to Isabel. Some of the nuns were sitting at the great oak table, Hildegard at its head, Isabel alone on her left-hand side. Other sisters drifted around the room, their feet making soft, scuffing sounds on the polished floor. They kept bringing her food, milk, bread, oat biscuits, cheese. There was something vaguely biblical about the stuff they brought, as though their choice of sustenance might help bring her back to God. Or maybe just back to them. It never occurred to me that people would assume Jessica was alive and I was dead. Isabel looked from one face to another. I know it was stupid of me to change clothes. I simply didn't think. You could not have travelled all that way in a habit, sister. Eugenia spoke up. Changing clothes was entirely sensible, and Jessica would have been the first to agree. What I don't understand is why you didn't contact the police when you had the chance. Yes, said Belinda. Once she met the other pilgrims, you were safe, surely. You should eat something, sister. Try honey on that bread. Or I can bring you some of the apricot jam. I was going to contact them from here. I felt I could deal with them, with all of it, if I was here, with all of you. For a second, Isabel was tempted to reach out her hand. She'd always been fond of Belinda. But something held her back. These women were looking at her with a mixture of pity and curiosity, but with something else, too. Maybe a hint of alarm. She might have returned to them, but she wasn't one of them again. Not yet. But then, in a cafe, early on the second day, I saw the news, she went on. I realised what I'd done, and that Neil would believe his fiancée was alive when she wasn't, and... There was something stuck in her throat. She shouldn't have tried to eat anything, except she didn't think she had. The bread on her plate was untouched. She was... Pregnant, she managed. Jessie was having a baby, sisters. A low-pitched moan, almost musical, seemed to hum around the room. 
Hildegard dropped her face into her hands. I identified her body, Hildegard said through her fingers. I told the police she was you. If anyone's to blame, it's me. You'd think after all these years I'd be able to tell the two of you apart. From what you told us, her face was very badly damaged, Mother, said Florentina. And let's be honest now, Tabitha piped up. It's been quite some time since you had an eye test. She pushed her chair back. Oh, excuse me a moment, Mother. I can hear the kitchen door banging. It's blown open again. Hildegard nodded sadly as Tabitha left the room. I felt I should be the one to tell Neil the truth, to explain, Isabel said. And so I set off for York, but on the way I had a lot of time to think. Jessie recognised the man we saw attacking the girl on the ground. The man I've learned since is called Patrick Farr. And she was investigating the police in Northumberland. She knew they were involved in people trafficking. She'd been working undercover, posing as a Polish cleaner in their office. You know how good she was with languages. Hildegard gave a single nod of assent. Around her, black-clad heads bounced and veils swayed. Not just the usual people trafficking, though, said Isabel. Patrick Farr and his family are smuggling illegal immigrants into the country to order, to provide healthy organs for sick, rich people. The nuns across the table seemed to press closer. The one still moving around the room paused. That we should live to see so much evil in the world, said Hildegard. And the police are involved too, asked Serapis. Someone in the police is. Jessica had her suspicions about who, but she wasn't sure. There's a doctor too, this Mr. Wallace, whom she mentioned before. He's the one who finds the... I'm not really sure what you'd call them. Customers, suggested Belinda. Let's just call them patients, said Isabel. They come to his clinics in Harley Street or Newcastle, and he spins them a story about brain-dead donors being flown in from overseas, about the money they'll pay going to help poor families. But the donors are alive and healthy when they arrive, said Eugenia. Isabel nodded. Do you remember that last time Jessie came to see us in the summer? She said. We were talking in the Garden of Repose about how we couldn't see any way organs could be bought and sold because the system in the UK is so rigorous. The sisters' faces creased in concentration. I remember, said Basilia. We were talking about that little foreign girl who'd been killed in a car accident and I said that even if she'd been killed deliberately, even if the accident had been... Uh, what's the word? Staged? suggested Eugenia. Yes, exactly. So that her organs could be made available, Basilia said. Even if that was the case, they'd still go into the system, along with those of all the genuine donors, and be allocated according to the rules. I said that. I said they could end up anywhere. Unless the system was being manipulated, said Isabel. Jess was about to tell us how she thought it could be done when... When I happened upon the scene and reminded you all of your primary duties here. With a creaking of bones and a rustling of fabric, Hildegard stood and arched her back. Prayer and contemplation. Not CSI Northumberland, hm? As one, the nuns across the table bowed their heads and clasped their hands together. Then, one at a time, the boldest first, their eyes darted back up to fix again on Isabel. Standing at the head of the table, Hildegard didn't move away. She nodded once, a signal that the conversation could continue. 
Do you remember Jessica explaining that location is one of the factors taken into account when organs become available and a recipient is sought? Isabel said. A heart, for example, wouldn't be flown from here to Kent if a suitable recipient lived locally. Yes, I remember her saying that, said Serapis. Well, take that little girl, Ayat. There would be a lot of people waiting for her organs, but only a few of them would be physically compatible. Of those few, how many do you think would have been in Liverpool, near the hospital where she was dying? Maybe just one, said Eugenia. The one that counts. So what are you suggesting? asked Hildegard. That... The system would actually work in favour of the traffickers, interrupted Sister Belinda. They wouldn't have to get round it at all. Just make sure the donor died in the right place. And if there was more than one recipient in Liverpool, said Eugenia, if the organ needed was assigned to the wrong person, then they'd kill someone else, said Isabel. They're bringing in people by the van load, keeping them at the far family home until they're needed. Maybe the next one would drown in the Mersey, to save anyone getting too suspicious. Sometimes the accidents go wrong. The little girl, for example. And another woman Jessica found called Adar. She's still in hospital in Derby. It doesn't matter to these people, because there are always plenty more where they came from. Shocked silence seemed to settle over the room like a damp towel. More than one woman started moving her lips. Several pale hands reached up for the crosses they all wore around their necks. Isabel could feel the prayers floating around the room like the humming of trapped bees. And Jessica told you all this? asked Hildegard. Some of it. Right before the crash, though, she did one last thing. I knew it must be important for her to think of it when we were all so scared. She sent a text to Neil, telling him the password for her laptop. Isabel dropped her eyes to the thin silver computer on the refectory table. All the details of the case, including things she hadn't had time to share with the rest of her team, were on the laptop that she'd left at home. I think she wanted to make sure Neil could access it before anyone else could get their hands on it. And I don't know. She looked around, helplessly. Wipe it clean, suggested Basilia. Take a sledgehammer to it, said Belinda. Uh, has someone moved the cheese knife? Tabitha came back into the room carrying a covered dish. I remembered the new cheddar. I'm sure we can tempt Sister with a small piece. Yes, said Isabel. I think Jessica was worried about the laptop going astray. But Neil didn't have his phone. She must have forgotten in the heat of the moment. She told me that morning when we were driving to meet the balloon that he'd left it at home. So I knew I had to find the phone and the laptop and make sure they were safe. And Jessica thought the police were involved asked Eugenia. She was sure of it. She went undercover to find out who. Hold on a cotton picking, Sister Belinda caught Hildegard's eye. I mean, forgive my interrupting, Sister, but whilst I understand your engagement in Jessica's work, at some point in the last three days you must have thought, this has gone too far, I have to go to the police. She looked round almost guiltily. I mean, they can't all be bent. When should I have done that? Isabel asked. When Patrick Farr followed me to Belford and then to York, and I realised only the police could have told him where I was or was likely to be. Belinda dropped her eyes. Isabel went on. When they nearly caught me in York, fleeing a murder scene at which I'd left behind a knife with my fingerprints on it and a jacket covered in blood. They'll probably try to blame me for the balloon crash as well. They can't do that, 
said Sister Florentina. Has there been anything on the news about finding the pilot's body? asked Isabel. What about the poor woman we saw far attacking from the balloon? Has she been found? I am the only person left alive who knows what happened. You're also the perfect fall guy, said Sister Belinda. A grief-stricken, emotionally unstable, religious knot. Sister! Hildegard's face was a picture of shocked disappointment. Belinda is right, said Isabel. Once the police find me, I'm likely to be charged with murder. If Patrick Farr gets to me first, he'll save them the trouble. And yes, sisters, in case you were wondering, I am completely terrified. Hildegard walked to the window and looked out. Isabel could see her reflection frown in the glass. Sister Winifred, Hildegard said, would you please take four of the other sisters and check that the convent gates are locked? Without looking round, Winifred put down the candlestick she'd been polishing and stepped gracefully towards the door. Mother, if he's followed me here, he can climb that wall. I've done it. Isabel stopped herself. He can climb over the wall. We should lock the doors. Make sure there are no windows open. I'll be going in a few minutes. You'll be safe once I've gone. Hmm. Hildegard's frown deepened. Doors and windows, please, Sister Winifred. Please take care. And tell the other sisters that nobody goes outside. In fact, I think it's better that they all come and join us here. Belinda bounced to her feet. Mother, may I have permission to go to the bell tower? It's possible to see a long way from up there. I can take the peacock binoculars. If anyone tries to steal a march on us, well, I'll see them coming. Hildegard bowed her head in agreement, then waited for the refectory door to close behind Winifred and Belinda. Eugenia said, But why on earth would you get into his van in York? He already had Jessica's computer. Surely that was taking the most terrible risk. Far had Neil's mobile phone, the one with the password. I had to find the password before the police found me. I thought perhaps I could get it back when he stopped for petrol or something. Did you? asked Tabitha. Isabel shook her head. It must have been in his jacket pocket, and he never took it off. But it turns out I didn't need it after all. I guessed Jessica's password first time. Hildegard resumed her seat, with a waft of incense and body odour. It was Magdalena. After me. The first sign of a smile broke Hildegard's face. Well, that at least doesn't surprise me, she said. So have you read her files? asked Tabitha. Yes, said Isabel. I know everything. I know what she knew or suspected. I know about the people being smuggled across Europe into Northumberland and then taken to the Yellow House, where they're tested for blood type and the other thing that's relevant. I know that a consultant called Ralph Wallace handles the medical side of it all, that someone in the police is helping the Farr family create fake identities for these people and get them on the donor register. He or she probably arranges the accidents, too, wherever it is they're needed. The Farr family pose as next of kin and sign the consent forms. The police keep people away from the ports when the people are smuggled in. Do you know why? asked Hildegard. Do you know why they're doing such a terrible thing? I think so, Isabel replied. I think it all started with a young police officer called Moira Farr. Chapter 103 Three Years Earlier Sometimes Patrick looked at the scrapyard and found the wall of wrecked cars unnerving. 
the headlights or gaping holes where headlights used to be, all looked inwards at the row of caravans, at the yellow farmhouse, at the people who moved around the cinder gravel site, giving him a sense of constant vigilance. Other times he found it reassuring. The cars were the walls of the family citadel, guarding them against the outside world, shielding them from the worst of the weather, providing the income that kept them all fed. The cars arrived, no longer roadworthy but largely intact, and were nibbled away. Petrol was drained into a tank that supplied the family's own cars. Batteries were removed and sold on, followed quickly by sound systems, tyres, seats, steering wheels, then body panels. The cars grew lesser until only the shells remained. And still they watched him. Sometimes he woke in the night when the moon was full, and imagined the glow around his caravan was the light of hundreds of ghostly headlamps, and that if he went outside, he never did on such nights, he'd see them all turned on, shining brightly, showing the world what he really was. Two weeks into August, on a night as warm as ever occurred this far north, all but the very young members of the family were up, playing cards, drinking, watching the smoke rise from the oil drum fires. Rock music was playing in one of the caravans, but by the time it reached Patrick it was tinny and distorted. He heard the clanging and scraping of the big gates being opened and recognised the black estate car. Through the fog of cigarette and fire smoke, it seemed to glide into the yard. As the driver door opened, he grabbed the bottle at his feet and poured another drink, bigger than he'd intended. When he raised his head, his mother was watching him. He could smell Moira before she came into his eyeline. Her perfume wound its way through the smoke and the cooking smells, through the cannabis and the whiskey fumes, and he actually put a hand up to his face to shut it out. Too late. That peculiar mix of jasmine and lemons was seeping its way inside him. More than once he'd stood at perfume counters in big stores trying to identify the scent she used. He never could. No other woman ever smelled the way she did. Moira, is it you, girl? said their mother. Come and sit beside me. Patrick, get a drink for your sister. Her accent had long been softer, more English than that of the rest of them. But even so, he knew from the low, flat pitch of her voice that something was wrong. Not for me, thanks, ma'am, she said. I'll make myself a coffee later. He heard the springs of the plastic chair as she sat. His sister was wearing black as usual. Her jeans were tight, her boots knee-high. Her vest top cut away to show off the muscles of her shoulders and upper arms. She'd demand his jacket later, like she always did, and then he'd be stuck with the smell of her all night. Not drinking? What are you, ill or pregnant? His mother laughed, but the laugh turned into a cough and she bent forward, her shoulders rising and falling as she hacked the blockage out of her throat. Well, I'm not pregnant, that's for sure. She caught Patrick's eye as she leaned over to pat their mother on the back. How are you, Pat? Sound. He let his eyes drink her in. The mass of black curls around her head. The eyes that seemed to bounce back light. Skin like dark cream. He always won these staring competitions. She always looked away first. As she turned back to their mother... Her face flinched in a tiny contraction of muscles that nobody but he could have seen. She leaned back as though in pain, and with the fingers of her right hand began rubbing at her upper left arm. A burst of laughter sounded. The poker game had finished. Money was changing hands. How's that fellow of yours? The mother had finished her coughing and was lighting another fag. He sounded... Sends his apologies. 
there were muffled titters around the group. For the most part, Moira's husband avoided her family. He thinks it's better not to know, she explained once. We had a visit from your lot last week, one of Patrick's uncles called over. Here for an hour, poking in everywhere. Found nothing. Not my lot. Moira slipped a hand beneath her vest and rubbed at her stomach. All the fucking same. Are you ill? Patrick put his glass down. The light wasn't good enough to look properly at his sister. The cheap electric bulbs distorted everything. Even his mother had a sickly yellow tint to her skin. What are you talking about? She frowned at him and dropped her eyes. If you're not pregnant, what's up with you? Who says something's up with me? I've got to drive back. I've got to be up at six. We don't all need half a bottle down our necks to sleep at night. You don't look yourself. Their ma'am had noticed now. She'd take it from here. She was peering closer. Well, fetch me that lamp. Don't bother. Moira held up both hands in surrender and slumped a little in the chair, as though she'd given up the effort to look normal. I came here to tell you. Patrick had a sense of the others drawing nearer. The new card game paused. His cousin shushed the baby. I'm not well, ma'am. Moira spoke to their mother, but her voice was loud enough to carry to them all. I've been having tests. I didn't want to say anything until I was sure. Patrick had a sense of the very cars leaning closer, their skeleton bodies quivering in disbelief. Not Moira. Anyone but Moira. Nobody spoke. Nobody asked her for details. No one wanted to know the worst. What? Their ma'am cracked first. My liver. Turns out the liver is fairly crucial to ongoing life. Liver? Ma'am's eyes dropped to the bottle by Patrick's chair, to the glass in her own hand. You've never been a drinker. I know. For fuck's sake, if I'm going to pay the price, you'd think I'd have had the benefit first. But it turns out not all liver problems are drink-related. What then? One of the cousins asked. Moira took a deep breath. I have something called primary sclerosing cholangitis, she said. It's quite rare. No one knows what causes it. And for a long time there are no symptoms. I've had it for several years and didn't know a thing. God bless you and save you, said ma'am as though God hadn't given up on Moira and the whole damn bunch of them a long time ago. What can be done? There is no treatment. Four simple words that told him his world was about to end. Patrick got up and walked away, stopping when he reached the low wall that surrounded the yellow house. I know you can hear me, dumbass, and I'm not about to repeat myself. Her voice reached him like the pictures he couldn't shut out of his head. I'm going to tell you once. We can all have a bloody good moan and then we get on with the rest of our lives. At least you lot do. Don't joke. Moira dead. Moira's corpse lying in one of the ridiculously over-elaborate coffins the family always chose when one of them passed. Moira, reduced to a headstone and memories. I'm not joking, ma'am. I can expect cirrhosis of the liver, or rather for what I've got already to get worse. Quite possibly cancer of the liver and then liver failure. I won't be making plans beyond the next couple of years, and we've been advised that trying for a baby right now would be very irresponsible. One of the women began to cry. I don't believe there's nothing they can do. 
Charles had come to stand behind their mother, had put his hands on her shoulders as though forcibly keeping her in her seat. My only chance is a transplant. Sometime in the next twelve months, ideally, before I get much worse. With a new liver, I could live as long as the rest of you. Well, then that's what has to happen. <laughs> Out of our control, ma'am. I join the waiting list, which is long, and I have a genetic makeup that is not common. The chances aren't good. Patrick walked away from the camp. Chapter 104 A week after his sister's confession to the family, Patrick pushed open the door of the pub and stepped inside. It was early in the evening, and he could still see the bar could still make his way across the carpet without having to push people out of the way. In a couple of hours the place would be crammed with hot, sweating bodies. The man waiting had a pint in front of him and a double scotch. He slid the whisky over to Patrick. There's a breathalyzer unit on the A1 tonight, he said. I'd make that your only one if I were you. He led the way to a table by the window. Patrick pulled out a chair and sat down first. A mistake. His brother-in-law stayed upright, looking down at him, making him feel like a kid taken to the pub for a treat by an uncle. What? Patrick said. What is it you want? I want to talk about Moira. I'm assuming you give a fuck, in spite of the impression you give most of the time. She told us. She didn't tell you everything. I'm listening. His brother-in-law pulled out a chair. She needs a transplant, he said. The chair groaned as he sat on it. But the chance of one is less than five percent. One in five people on the transplant list will die before a liver becomes available. With her genetic makeup, am I supposed to know what that is? You know the legend about how you lot came from India originally? Patrick shrugged. The Romani people, or gypsies, were believed to have migrated throughout Europe from northern India. It was supposed to explain their dark hair and eyes. Well, it turns out it could be true. Either that or you have Asian ancestors somewhere not too far back. And the constant inbreeding over the years hasn't helped either. Your sister needs a donor from that part of the world to reduce the chance of her body rejecting the new organ. Trouble is, there are almost no donors from there. Why are you telling me this? Because there's such a thing as living donors. The liver is a weird organ. It can grow back. Someone physically compatible can donate half their organ to my wife and suffer no ill effects other than being a bit tired and sore for a few weeks. I'm not a match. We already checked. But I might be. His brother-in-law inclined his head. Given how close you lot are, there could be several potential donors in that scrapyard you call home. And that's before you approach the wider family. I'll do it. Appreciate that. But you might not be a match either. I'm a fucking brother. Why didn't she tell us? Because there are always risks with surgery, and she didn't want to put anyone in that position. I figured you'd want to know. Patrick felt something burning in his chest, something that had nothing to do with the scotch. He could save her. He'd rip his own liver out here and now if it could save Moira. There was nothing he would not do to save Moira. Chapter 105 Right, okay, yes. The doctor looked nervous. Patrick doubted he'd ever before seen fifteen people crammed into his consulting room at once, including a six-month-old baby in a buggy. Nobody wanted the bad news secondhand. Moira, in spite of visibly weakening every time he saw her now, had refused to sit down insisting instead that her mother and cousin take the only two seats. If they're going under the knife, they want to hear it from you. 
she was standing next to her husband on one side of the room. She'd have gone to the back if she'd been allowed. It was like she was trying to pretend this wasn't all about her, that she was an onlooker like the rest of them, worried, of course, but not directly involved. So come on, lad. Which of us is it? Their mother was directly in front of the young, anxious doctor, her arms folded. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid it isn't good news. The git couldn't look at them. Patrick had known from the minute he'd set foot in the room that it wasn't going to be good. None of you is a match. The doctor looked up then, timidly, like a young deer in the rifle sights. That's fucking impossible. Ma waved her arm around, as though he might not have noticed the sheer number of them. I brought you fifteen donors. One of us must be suitable. The doctor picked a pen up from the desk and began twirling it. I certainly would have hoped so, but no. We can't operate on any of you. The chances of organ rejection are too great for us to risk surgery. Good. Finally, Moira looked up. I wouldn't have agreed anyway. It just saves an argument. We didn't test Rebecca, Patrick said. No! Moira's eyes shot round to meet his. She's fifteen. The doctor shook his head. We couldn't use a minor, he said. It wouldn't be ethical. She hasn't moved off the list at all. Patrick's brother-in-law lifted his eyes from the back of his wife's head. She's been on the transplant list for three months now, and she hasn't moved. I can't believe there have been no liver transplants in that time. Almost certainly there will have been, but I did explain to you that Moira's requirements are uncommon. She may have to wait a little longer than most. What if we go abroad? Patrick spoke up. If our genetic what's it is Indian, it's simple. We go to India and wait for a donor there. We pay someone. That's not illegal there, I checked. I'm not flying to India to buy a poor person's liver, said Moira. Forget it, Pat. He snapped. He didn't mean to. But misery and worry and frustration meant he spent his life pissed off these days. What, you're just going to give up? Moira's face contracted and she leaned back against her husband. She put on such a front it was easy to forget how ill she was. And then you caught a glimpse of the colour of her skin in the daylight, of the yellowing of her eyes, or her too thin frame, and you realised that time was running out. I don't recommend going to India, said the doctor. Even if livers are available, I couldn't guarantee the safety of the procedures. Most ethical surgeons, I imagine, will steer clear of commercial operations. There would be a high risk of infection, of something going wrong. And don't forget, while you're out in India, waiting, you could miss the chance of a transplant here. Not while she's way down the list. Moira's husband had wrapped his arms around his wife. She'd pulled against him once, then given in, leaning back and closing her eyes. That list isn't set in stone. If an organ became available that was a good match for Moira, if it was available close by, geographically, there's every chance a match would be made, and she'd be bumped straight to the top of the list. I hate that someone has to die for me to live, said Moira, her eyes still shut. That's a common reaction, said the doctor. But what you have to remember is that you haven't caused someone else's misfortune. They would have died anyway. We want a second opinion. Their mother had folded her arms and planted them on top of her bosom. Her kids had learned long ago that you didn't argue with Ma in that mood. Luckily for him, the doctor didn't either. Chapter 106 Mr. Ralph Wallace, one of the country's pre-eminent transplant surgeons, was taking no nonsense from the mob-handed family of gypsies in his waiting room. 
I'll see Miss Farr herself, her husband and her mother. He strode ahead of them into his consulting room. Patrick held open the door for the others, then slipped inside after them. I'm her twin, he announced to the surprised surgeon, knowing none of the family would correct him. He and Moira were only ten months apart. It was close enough. Wallace was a Scot, from somewhere around Edinburgh. He was in his early sixties, slender and pale-skinned. I've had a chance to look through your notes. He took his seat and removed a pair of glasses from a case on the desk. And the good news is that should a donor organ become available in the near future, there is every reason for optimism. There are no signs of tumour yet and minimal damage to the kidneys. On the other hand, I'm afraid I can't disagree with my colleague. None of the family are suitable donors and I really don't recommend travelling to India. While you are as ill as you are, Miss Farr, home is the best place for you. And your situation could change overnight. I haven't been given any reason to be optimistic about a donor, said Patrick's brother-in-law. Well, there I don't quite share my colleague's view, said Wallace. Twenty years ago, he'd have had a point. But the population of the UK is changing all the time. The birth rate among the Asian population is higher than among native British people. We've seen increasing numbers of immigrants from southern Europe in recent years. A lot of asylum seekers are from the Middle East and North Africa. All of these people are potential donors. Great, said Patrick. We we'll just need a few of them to die. Chapter 107 Friday the 22nd of September As the kitchen door closed behind the elderly bespectacled nun, Patrick stepped out of the store cupboard. Through a gap in the door, he'd watched her stare down at the countertop, registering the disappearance of the knife, the one that was currently tucked into his belt. He'd seen her pull up the back of her skirt to scratch at her ass before stepping to a door next to the cupboard he was hiding in and taking out a covered dish. He couldn't risk someone coming back. Following an inbuilt sense of direction, reliable as the magnetic north in a compass, he slipped back outside and then into a long, narrow greenhouse that ran most of the length of the back wall of the building. Instantly, the temperature rose by several degrees, and there was a scented dampness in the air that made him think of thunderstorms in the forest. A scrabbling in the knee-high foliage made him jump, but he put it down to rats and carried on. There was another door leading back into the convent at the far end. This time he found himself in a library, a large room lined by wooden bookshelves. Built into one wall was a slate fireplace. The rug beneath his feet was Turkish, red and highly patterned, but so thin the dull floorboards beneath could be seen in places. His tinker's instincts took him on a detour around the side of the room, pausing to stare into glass-topped cabinets, on the lookout for anything of value. What he saw were papers, written in a faded, incomprehensible script, the odd small box even what looked like a shriveled finger. No gold, silver, jewellery or coins. The tropical scented damp of the greenhouse had given way to a smell of mould and rodent droppings. When he looked more carefully at the books, he saw that some of the shelves carried great water stains. These books hadn't been touched in years. They'd turn to mush if someone tried to pull one off the shelves. The decrepit books, though, were solid enough to insulate sound, and Patrick could hear nothing but his own footsteps. Then a high-pitched screech from behind him made him leap like a whipped dog. There was something in the greenhouse. Black-clad women, sharp-taloned, teeth-like fangs, bearing down on him. These weren't nuns. They were witches. He was actually crossing himself like his mother did, 
something he hadn't done in years, as he strode back to check out what was in there. It was a bird, a peacock. It was strutting the length of the greenhouse like it owned the frigging place, and if he didn't have bigger fish to fry, he'd wring the fucker's neck right now. He wiped the back of his hand over both temples. Ashamed of his nerves, of how this place, with its odd mix of religious and feminine mystery, was making him feel, he left the room. The hallway beyond was empty. The great front doors closed. Voices were coming from the right, from the room beyond the staircase. He walked over and waited outside. He had no idea what the woman he was hunting sounded like, only that he would know her voice when he heard it. Chapter 108 So it was about love, then, not money, said Hildegard. In the beginning, anyway. Yes, said Isabel. A young woman dying before her time, and a family who simply couldn't bear to let her go. What is it they say about the road to hell? said Serapis. The sound of running footsteps made them all start. Then the refectory door opened, and the round, freckled face of Sister Belinda appeared. She was breathing heavily, and her veil was crooked, showing short tufts of red hair sprouting around her glowing face like unruly weeds in a parched garden. "'Excuse me, mother, sisters,' she said. "'But there's a police car waiting at the gate, and what looks like the Black Mariah behind it. Also another car approaching from the farm and a uniformed constable coming in via the beach path. It would appear that the filth have us surrounded.' Chapter 109 This time, Ajax didn't follow the nun up the convent drive. He steered his car around her, over the grass and on towards the house. So did the police van behind him. On the car radio he heard that the car approaching via the farm was at the back of the property. The officers on foot were already at the convent building. There were four doors that he knew of. In a couple of minutes they'd all be covered. At the imposing front entrance, he pulled on the handbrake and got out, his Kevlar vest uncomfortably tight around his chest. They really didn't make them in his size. The van pulled up alongside, and he caught a glimpse of the officers in the back, fastening helmet straps, checking their weapons. The sergeant from the armed response unit, who would be in charge of the operation, jumped down. "'Stand back, sir, please,' he said to Ajax, as he strode to the huge double doors and banged hard. "'Armed police, open up!' "'God, I hope someone's videoing this,' said Mojo. "'A bunch of middle-aged nuns being told to get down and spread them. The sergeant in charge tried the door. It was locked. He banged again, louder this time. "'Armed police!' No response. An officer carried the steel enforcer over and held it ready. I'm sure Sister Approaching Swiftly has a key. Mojo pointed back towards the nun who'd opened the gates. She was about twenty minutes away, still continuing at the same unruffled pace. Seems a shame to damage those lovely oak doors. Ajax thought about intervening and decided against it. He kept quiet as the steel enforcer was pushed against the old doors. The lock broke instantly. The black-clad, armour-plated, helmeted officers poured inside and spread out like busy black insects in search of a honey spill. "'Can't hear any returned fire,' said Mojo. "'It's probably safe to venture in.' The sergeant was in the hallway, still and wary his eyes moving in large, slow circles around the room. Two police officers, their backs to each other, were making their way up the stairs. Another stood guard to one side of the door. The rest had moved into the house. No sign of any of the nuns. 
They're all in chapel, Sarge. A voice shouted from somewhere in the building. Ajax and the sergeant turned together, went through a set of doors and down a short corridor. On the radios he could hear the search going on throughout the rest of the house, doors being slammed and a series of short, sharp orders. Police! Clear! As they approached the chapel, they could hear singing, the same Latin plain song Ajax had heard on his last visit. Two officers stood guard either side of the doors. Not locked, Sarge, said one. The sergeant nodded at them to proceed. As the officers pulled back both doors, he strode through into the small, high, medieval space. Armed police, he shouted. Nobody move. Nobody did. Chapter 110 Ajax stepped into the convent's chapel behind the armed response sergeant. The chapel was cream, with a lattice work of gold-painted wood decorating the central dome. A raised wooden platform held the altar, whilst the rear wall was panelled in a rich, dark wood. A lectern stood to one side of the altar, an elaborate wooden chair for a visiting priest on the other. The stone flags were smooth beneath his feet. The pews were carved wood, high and densely packed. When full, the chapel might seat over a hundred. The light was subdued. Some hours past noon, no direct sunlight was coming through the stained glass windows. In walled recesses on the chancel steps, in ornate candelabra, great wax candles flickered. The forty or so nuns were in the front pews their black flowing robes gleaming in the soft light. That's a lot of nuns, muttered Mojo. Everybody hands up, ordered the sergeant from halfway down the aisle. The nuns carried on singing. Not a single hand moved. The sergeant reached the front pew and kept going, pivoting, taking the last couple of steps backwards to bring him up against the chancel, Reflections of the altar candles danced on either side of his black helmet. This is Northumbria on police, he said. Can you all put your hands in the air? The nun showed no sign of having heard. At the back of the chapel immediately behind Ajax, several armed officers had spread out, weapons pointed inwards at the sisters. God help us, Ajax muttered as he walked forward. Bit late for that, said Mojo. One of the nuns, Mother Hildegard, he saw as she stepped into the light, raised her right hand and the singing stopped. As one, the nuns lowered their heads so that nothing of their faces could be seen. At one signal, they had become serried ranks of shapeless black figures. Ajax had reached the front. For what reason do you disturb our devotions, Superintendent Maldonado? said Mother Hildegard. The armed sergeant kept his face blank, his stare into the middle distance. I've got a warrant for the arrest of Isabel Jones, also known as Sister Maria Magdalena. Do you know where she is? As Ajax spoke, he looked along the lines of black-veiled figures. Barring a couple of very short ones, she could be any of them. Given that we have been mourning the loss of our sister for two days now, I imagine she is with our father in heaven, said Mother Hildegard. Although I admit there were moments in our relationship when I had my doubts as to her ultimate destination. Please continue with your prayers, sisters. I have no doubt this interruption will be soon concluded. Ajax saw the gleam in the old nun's eyes, and knew it wasn't caused by candlelight. Her sister's car has been moved from where it was left on Wednesday morning. It was caught on camera heading in this direction, and we've just spotted it parked a mile away, he said. Then perhaps you should look for Sister Maria Magdalena a mile away. You identified her body two days ago, 
Were you lying? Hildegard's eyebrows twitched upwards. Truth is a virtue that is much prized here, she said. If I made a mistake, I imagine it would be down to misleading information on your part and distress on mine. Do you know where she is? Ajax repeated. Hildegard set off across the chapel floor, speaking as she did so. I'm going to save some time, Superintendent, for our benefit, not yours. She reached the lectern and stretched out a hand to touch the huge leather-covered Bible. I swear on this most beloved book that to the very best of my knowledge, every living member of our community is here with us in this chapel. If Sister Maria Magdalena is in the building, she must be here too. You'll forgive me for being less definitive, but I've already been caught out in a lie this week where she is concerned. Ajax glanced round. There were no other doors, no cupboards. Ask the sisters to raise their heads, please, he said to Hildegard. Certainly not. Modesty is another virtue we value, and some of them are quite elderly with very bad shoulders. Ajax took a sharp breath. Sergeant, have your officers escort the sisters one by one to Mother Hildegard's office. I'll interview them there. They will not speak to you. This is a silent order. He took a step closer to her. Hildegard was a tall woman, but few people of either sex came close to his height. I will have the whole lot of you arrested and held in custody overnight, he said. The nun stared at him, unabashed. Seriously? she said. Ajax turned to the sergeant. I need two female officers now. The women police officers were brought forward. I need to see their faces, Ajax told them, trying not to be distracted by the smirks of the armed officers around him. As gently as you can, because I do not want accusations of police brutality from the Vatican. Can you raise their heads, so that I can get a look at each of them? As he spoke, Mother Hildegard slipped back into line and lowered her own head. She was now indistinguishable from the rest. Ajax walked the end of the front row. Excuse me, sister, he said. I won't keep you long. One female officer held the nun tentatively by the shoulders. The other raised her head by pushing up under the chin. The nun, with a round, freckled, red face, lifted her head but kept her eyes down. Definitely not Maria Magdalena. Thank you. He moved on to the next. It took nearly ten minutes to examine all of the nuns, but at the end of it, he was as sure as it was possible to be that Isabel Jones wasn't amongst them. Chapter 111 Hildegard stepped across the stone floor to the far right side of the chancel. You can come out now, sister, she said to the chapel wall. The huge carved oak chair began to move forward and then slide sideways. Its high arched back became a door in the wall, revealing as it opened a small stone-lined space with a wooden chair and a tiny inset altar. It was a priest's hole, dating back to the days when Catholicism was outlawed in England, and the great Catholic houses kept hidey holes to guard their priests from harassment, even death. Isabel, still dressed in Jessica's clothes, stepped out. At that moment they heard running footsteps, and the chapel doors opened again. They've all left the house, but they're still in the grounds, said Sister Belinda from the open doorway. I think they're pulling back to the perimeter, but we have to expect they're going to keep a watching brief, probably into the small hours. Hildegard rolled her eyes. Five hundred metres down the South June Path, 
At the point where the bridleway runs into the woods, you'll find a bicycle, she told Isabel. If you get as far as Haggerston, go to the post office. Maisie and Fred's Vauxhall will be in the drive, and the keys in the ignition. Fred says you might need a bit of choke, but to be careful not to flood it. And the gearbox is getting a bit rubbery, but it's sound. Mother, the police will have some sort of listening device on our phone, said Isabel. They'll have heard you make the phone call. Way ahead of you, sister. Eugenia dug deep into her habit and pulled out a mobile phone, which she held out to Isabel. We used this. Bought for cash, pay as you go. My nephew got it for me in Newcastle. For emergencies. You should have it, sister. Begging your pardon again, mother. Hildegard shook her head. In the greater scheme of things... Isabel took the phone and slipped it into her own pocket. Her rucksack was still in the priest's hole. I'm leaving Jessica's computer with you, she told Hildegard. If anything happens to me... Nothing will happen to you, interrupted Sister Florentina. If anything happens to me, take it to the newspapers. Don't trust the local police. You know the password? Then let's do that now. Florentina was becoming agitated. There's no need for you to take any more foolish risks. We call the papers now on Sister Eugenia's phone and we tell them what Jessica found out. Jessica had no proof. Isabel looked around, trying to meet each sister's eyes in turn. They were so dear to her, these women, and she might never see them all together like this again. The people I saw brought to the yellow house last night will have been moved by now. All trace of them has probably been scrubbed away. The pilot's body and the body of that poor girl I saw killed will never be found. The surgeon, that Wallace man, will deny any involvement. There's nothing to definitely link any police officer with what's been going on. Without proof, Jessica died for nothing. Nobody spoke. And besides, I'm wanted on two counts of murder, which really isn't good for the convent's reputation. Belinda grinned for a split second, then burst into tears. Hildegard leaned forward and kissed Isabel on the forehead. God be with you, my dear. She sniffed once, before turning to the others. Sisters, you all know what you have to do. Chapter 112 Ajax, they're coming out. Ajax picked up his radio and tapped the car brakes. Who's coming out? How many? All of them. Cursing, Ajax pulled over and looked back. The road was clear. He turned the car, tricky on such a narrow road, and set off back towards the convent. He shouldn't have left. He'd damn well known there was something going on. Talk to me, he barked into the radio. There's a white van approaching from the farm. It didn't turn off the road, so it must be a farm vehicle. It's pulling up at the back door, and the nun's own car is being driven out the garage. It's coming round the front. You should be able to see it soon. I've got it, another voice picked up. It's heading down the drive now. I can see two people inside, so we've also got a group coming down the front steps on foot. I can count, er, uh, seven. No, eight. More at the back too, Sarge. At least ten. And some leaving via the side door. Ajax pressed his foot down. What the hell are they doing? Just walking, sir. They're all setting off in different directions. Some in groups, some on their own. The cars are the gate now. Do we let them out? The transit van's reversed right up to the back door. We can't see who's getting in and out. Check everyone who leaves the grounds, Ajax said. If she's between the ages of thirty and fifty, detain her until she can prove who she is. 
and someone count those friggin' nuns. There were forty-two in chapel. If forty-three have appeared, we've got her. Eh, uh, transit van's putting away. Heading back towards the farm. There could be anyone or anything in the back. I've got a bloke here with a peacock in his arm, Sarge. Want me to detain him? Thing looks vicious. That shit, watch it. I've got two sisters at the beach gate on bikes, sir. Neither answers to the description. One of them is in her seventies. The other's black. Ajax turned off the road and pulled up at the convent gates again. The police van was still there. The sergeant was talking to the driver of the convent's old Ford Focus. As Ajax got out of his car, he could see two nuns in the front seats. Where are you going, ladies? the sergeant asked them. Visiting the sick, replied the elder of the two. Eileen Richards was discharged from Berwick Infirmary last night. We're going to read to her from the scriptures and have an hour's uplifting conversation. You won't mind if we check in the boot? The boot was opened and closed. It was empty but for a travel rug and a spare wheel. The penguins everywhere, said the armed response sergeant, as he and Ajax pushed the gates closed again. He handed over a pair of binoculars. It's like watching happy feet. They're distracting us. Ajax trained the binoculars on a group of three nuns, who were following a narrow path towards a wooded area at the furthest corner of the convent grounds. One of them looked round and very stooped. The others... He was going to lose sight of them among the trees. How many people have we got on the dune side of the wall? he asked. The sergeant held up one hand to hush Ajax as he listened to his radio. We've stopped the white transit van, he said when he looked up again. Four nuns in the back who say they're going to the whist drive in Haggerston. One of them looks about the right age. I think you should go up there, sir. Ajax set off back to his car. Get some more people to the dunes. Northeastern corner, he said. Quick as you can. What about the peacock? Jesus, I am not interested in friggin' peacocks. He jumped into his car and set off towards the farm. Chapter 113 Hildegard, Florentina and Isabel reached the northeast corner of the convent grounds under cover of the trees. Isabel took off the borrowed veil and habit and handed them to Florentina. You're surely not going to climb that wall? Florentina was tucking the borrowed robes into her bodice. It looks awfully high. She's done it many times, Hildegard said. Take very good care for the next thirty minutes, sister. Why only thirty minutes? asked Isabel, as she looked for somewhere to put her foot. It will take us that long to get back into chapel, Hildegard replied. Then we can start praying. Chapter 114 Patrick spent fifteen minutes in the peacock cage before making his escape. The officer who'd stopped him as he left the greenhouse, the peacock tucked beneath his arm, had accepted his explanation that he was employed by the convent to look after the birds. He'd watched Patrick carry the bird into the cage, and then seen the others appear and surround him, presumably expecting food. Patrick had found grains in a plastic bucket and had scattered them around, hopping out of the way as the birds got too close to his feet. When he'd looked up, the police officer had gone. Once again, they weren't looking for a man. He saw several of the sisters moving round the grounds, but none of them looked his way. When no one seemed to be in sight, he left the cage and sauntered over to the wall. A quick glance around, and he was up and landing on the sandy wasteland on the other side. 
Chapter 115 The Vauxhall, belonging to Maisie and Fred, who ran the post office, was an easier drive than Jessica's Fiat, with fewer confusing switches and lights. Isabel started the engine without difficulty, and pulled away from the house in Haggerston as the curtains to the front room window twitched behind her. She travelled directly west until she reached the A698 between Berwick-upon-Tweed and Coldstream, and then turned south. The distance she had to travel was less than twenty miles, but most of the roads that would take her there were narrow, winding, and very slow. She expected roadblocks at every turn, but saw very few other vehicles, and none of them police cars. At Coldstream she left the main road, continuing south until she reached the National Park. She drove as far as she could, and then pulled over. With some time to kill, she ate the food the sisters had hurriedly packed for her. The rather odd combination of bread and honey and chocolate biscuits made her suspect that Sister Belinda had been on kitchen duty. A police vehicle was parked close to the spot where the balloon and its basket had finally come to a standstill and she could see at least two uniformed officers. There were several bystanders, too, staring in at the copse of trees. All the burned and scattered debris of the crash had been removed, but still they stared at the place where a murdering nun had begun her killing spree. Isabel found an outcrop of rocks and settled down, hoping dusk would come quickly and that the rain would hold off. Sister Serapis had lent her the binoculars the nuns used for spotting escaped peacocks, and she trained them on the trees, trying to find the place where her fall had been broken by the branches of a large beech tree. Once she looked at the faces of the people at the site, dreading to see a man with long curly hair and a leather trilby, that Patrick Farr would somehow know her plans, as he'd known them for the past three days and that he would be here, waiting. He wasn't. The group of four stood and stared for fifteen more minutes, and then moved on. Another group arrived within the half hour. They stayed for five minutes, but took a lot of photographs. At six o'clock another police vehicle arrived, this one with a solitary constable at the wheel. The officers on the day shift stood talking to him for a few minutes, before climbing into their own car and driving off. There was going to be a guard overnight. The day darkened. No one else came to the site. For a while the constable on watch kept his engine running and the interior light on. At seven o'clock he turned the engine off and the vehicle slipped into darkness. At half-past seven she could no longer see his face in the driver's seat. At eight, she risked moving. She took an indirect route, keeping close to a stone wall, so that when she entered the copse of trees she could no longer see the police vehicle. Even so, she crept forward, slipping from one shadow to the next, welcoming the screeching, the hooting, the sounds of the night that would deaden any noise she might be making. When she could see the gleam of white, yellow and blue bodywork again, she knew she was close. When she could hear music, she knew she was safe. He would never hear her. Climbing up was easier than climbing down had been. Easier to spot the knots and ridges than the first length of the trunk, for one thing, that helped her up high enough to reach the first branch. Easier to see where she was going for another, even in the almost complete darkness. Easier to bend and twist through the ever closer branches as she moved higher and the tree became more dense. Several times her coat caught, but she eased it free and pressed on. When she reached the point where several branches seemed to have broken, she knew she was at the right spot. Looking up, she could almost see the trail she'd made as she tumbled earthwards. She pulled herself onto the one that had been thick and strong enough to break her fall, and looked up. For several long minutes she didn't see it. 
she swayed left and right, ducked down and stretched up, and was on the point of deciding the journey here had been worthless, that she wouldn't get the proof she needed after all, when she leaned forward and looked up again. There, just out of reach, she could see a tiny corner of turquoise leather. Jessica's mobile phone was still here. Steadying herself with one hand, she stretched for it. The phone was dead. She turned it round in her hand, pressing buttons randomly. Nothing happened. The phone had broken in the fall. It was worthless. Then she heard Jessica's voice, loud in her head. It's a dead battery, you idiot. The phone's fine. Of course, mobile phones ran on batteries. This one had been in a tree for nearly three days. The photographs Jessica had taken of the dead pilot, of Patrick Farr pursuing them, would still be on it. So would her last message to Neil. Isabel slipped the phone into her pocket and began the slow, careful climb back down the tree. Leaving the copse the way she'd entered it, she hurried back to the car. She drove until she could see a signal on Sister Eugenia's mobile phone, and then pulled over and took out the card that Mother Hildegard had given her. Superintendent Maldonado, she said, when the deep male voice answered. This is Isabel. Chapter 116 Not far from the church, Isabel found a small car park. With Jessica's mobile locked in the glove compartment, she made her way on foot to the church. The gate's hinges creaked, announcing her presence to anyone who might be waiting. The path led directly to the church door. St Ninian's Catholic Church, Wooler, said the blue inlaid sign to the right of the doors. Most of the graves would be around the back. She kept the grass conscious that others would know these grounds better than she did. At the rear, where trees kept most of the street light at bay, she risked turning on the torch. If they were waiting, they would know she was here anyway. She scanned the churchyard with the torch beam, looking for raised graves, fresh graves, tucked away in the bottom corner in the narrow strip of land between the back of the church and the churchyard wall, was one with fresh-looking flowers. The turf laid over the grave had had time to thicken and for the first weeds to sprout. Isabel's torch picked up the spiral of a daisy, the zigzag leaf of a dandelion. The roses in the clay vase, though, appeared less than a week old and the marble of the headstone gleamed. The roses looked dark, almost black in the torchlight. She aimed the beam onto the headstone's wording as footsteps crunched on the gravel behind her. A single set of footsteps. He'd come alone. That meant she was in trouble. Chapter 117 Two and a half years earlier. Ajax found the accident easily enough. Crime scene tape was stretched across the entire width of the road. A hundred metres away, he could see an ambulance. A dozen or more officers surrounded the scene, their screamingly yellow jackets seeming to leach colour from the streetlights overhead. CSIs were here, too. Ajax, the officer in charge, greeted him. How's it going? Ajax said. Three paramedics were huddled over a form on the tarmac. Just been pronounced dead at the scene. They're about to zip her up. Ajax kept walking towards the ambulance. Female, right? Asian female, early thirties. On her own? At nine o'clock in February, the evening had long been dark. She had a kid with her. He's in one of the cars. 
waiting for relatives to arrive. From what he's told us, he and his mam were crossing the road when a car approached at some speed. Really fast, is what the kid said. His mum pushed him onto the pavement, but the car caught her. Her head struck the curb. The car had not stopped. The incident was now a fatal hit and run. Hence Ajax's presence. From the position we found her in, and from what we can get out of the kid, we're pretty certain the car was travelling south towards the A1148. No skid marks that we can see, the officer said. The car braked very briefly after it hit her, then accelerated away. Witnesses? Ajax didn't hold out much hope. The night was filthy. Uh, only the kid. They'd reached the paramedics. May I? Ajax crouched low, not waiting for permission. He lifted the plastic sheet. Someone leaned over with an umbrella. The woman was lying half on, half off the pavement. Her face above her eyebrows had been cut apart. The skin was loose and hanging. There wasn't much blood to be seen, but it could have been absorbed by the black cloth of the hijab. She looked Arabic rather than Indian or Pakistani. Has she got ID? Did she have a bag? Ajax glanced up at the nearest officer. I'm not sure. We'll find it. Make sure it goes with her to the hospital. In fact, can you personally take charge of that? Can you make sure all her personal effects, especially any wallet and documentation, goes with her? Of course, sir. The officer walked away. Ajax got to his feet. How are doing, tracing her next of kin? She lives a few streets away. We've sent someone round. Good. Make sure they get a lift to the hospital if they need one. He ignored the puzzled frowns. I need to talk to the kid. The child was huddled in a blanket in the back of a police car. He'd been weeping, but was quiet now. Name's Jaffa, the female constable with him told Ajax. Jaffa, I need to ask you some questions. Ajax never played softly, softly with kids, especially traumatised ones. It didn't help them, and it got him nowhere. What can you tell me about the car that hit your mother? Round black eyes stared back at him. We've already taken a statement from him, the constable whispered. Ajax ignored her. What colour was it? Silver. Good lad. Are you interested in cars? Do you know what kind it was? A blank stare. Do you know what a registration number is? An audible tutting sound from the constable. Did you see the driver? No driver. Ajax leaned closer. I'm sorry, Jaffa, what did you say? No driver. There was no driver. Ajax glanced across the street at the parked cars. Drivers and passengers in cars at night were difficult to spot, but not usually invisible. A runaway car would still be here. Oh, he's bending down, he muttered to himself, trying to reach something on the seat or something had to slip to the carpet. He didn't see them. Circle on front. Ajax turned back to the child. Circle on front of car. His little finger traced a circle shape in mid-air, about three inches in diameter. Ajax glanced at the car. I'll tell you what, Jaffa. Could you get out for a second and draw it for me? He held out his hand, helped the child down, then turned him to face the rear side panel of the police car. It was damp with rain. Like this. Ajax traced a circle. Bigger. Jaffa repeated the circle, then traced a diagonal cross in the middle of it. 
He stared at it as though not quite sure. Was it like this? Ajax drew another circle. This time, instead of a cross inside it, he drew a three-pointed star. Jaffa nodded. On the front of the car? In the middle of the bonnet? Another nod. Good lad, Jaffa. He was looking for a silver Mercedes. Chapter 118 The slender, grey-haired man who opened the door of the mock Tudor house was in his early sixties. His irritated frown at being disturbed so late turned to genuine puzzlement when he saw the large black man on his doorstep. What can I... Ajax held up his warrant card. Detective Chief Inspector Ajax Maldonado, Northumbria Police, he said. Can I have a moment of your time? The Tudor theme continued in the spacious marble-tiled hallway. Wooden beams, too straight and perfect ever to have come from a tree, stretched the length of the ceiling. The walls were panelled in what passed for wood until you got close. A miniature suit of armour stood to one side of some double doors. Ajax followed the man across the hall and into a study. He took the seat that was offered him, walnut with a striped silk cushion, and waited for his host to sit likewise. He didn't. Instead, he stopped in front of the desk and turned to face Ajax. Ajax took out his notebook, purely for show. There was nothing in it. He hadn't even brought a pen from the car. Can I ask where you were two nights ago, sir, between the hours of eight o'clock and ten o'clock, he said. The man turned, opened a leather-bound desk diary and studied it for a few seconds. Here, he said. I was working at the hospital until seven, then I had a drink at the golf club. I'm pretty certain I was home by eight-thirty, though. The hit-and-run accident in which a small boy's mother had been killed had happened closer to nine o'clock. You drive an E-class silver Mercedes, is that right? Ajax asked. It is. Can I see it? A polite smile. I'm afraid it's with my wife. She's at the theatre this evening. What time do you expect her home? She's staying with friends. I can try to call her, but she's notoriously bad about leaving her mobile on, especially when she's in the theatre. A car similar to yours was involved in a fatal hit-and-run on Wednesday night, on Woodstone Drive. The man frowned, allowed his eyes to drift as though the name sounded familiar, but he couldn't quite. I see. And you're checking all registered owners in the area. Very thorough. Well, I can bring it to the station tomorrow when she gets back. Around 2 p.m. probably will that suit. The car involved in the hit and run would have sustained some damage to the front left wing. I imagine so. Broken headlight, shards of glass in the road. I watch Crime Watch, Detective. You know... You look very familiar. I'm sure I've seen you somewhere before. Golf club? Can't afford the fees, Ajax said. The headlight was intact when the car left the scene, but some paint chippings were found on the victim's shoulder bag. They'll help us identify the model. Even the factory it came from. The man nodded, as though interested. It's really quite remarkable what you can do these days. Actually, our success in solving hit-and-run cases is abysmally poor. You don't say. Without witnesses, and there were none in this case, without CCTV footage, and how much of that is there on a residential street, we rely upon the conscience of the driver. We we'll have to hope he can't live with himself that he gets to the point where he has to give himself up. And how often does that happen? Hardly ever. 
People's instincts for self-preservation will nearly always outweigh their social conscience. Pity. You're right, you know. You and I have met before. I thought so. Drink? He glanced towards a table of decanters. Or is that not allowed? My wife is a patient of yours. We came to see you a few weeks ago. Really? He frowned. Maldonado is an unusual name. I'm sure I... She uses her maiden name still. She comes from a very old family. She promises me she'll change to mine if we ever have children. Yes. Families should have a name in common. Uh, Detective Maldonado, is there... We came en masse. About twelve of us. It's the way they are. Drove me mad at first, now I'm used to it. Oh, good lord. Moira Farr. I remember now. How is she? Moira Joanne Farr Maldonado. I call her Mojo. And she's worse. We can expect her to decline rapidly now. Ajax got up and crossed to the decanter table. You know, I think I will have that drink. He found a glass from the shelf, took the top off a decanter and poured. He had no idea what it was. He sat back down. The woman who was killed in the road traffic accident on Wednesday, Mr. Wallace, was thirty-two and in very good health. Her head was a mess, but the rest of her was fine. She was from the Middle East. Could have been a match for my wife. He raised the glass to his lips and swallowed. It was scotch. My wife could be lying in a hospital bed now, recovering from a transplant operation and reading a book of baby names. Instead, she's in bed at home, turning a more vivid shade of yellow every time I look at her. Wallace leaned back against the desk. I understand how you feel, and it does seem like a terrible waste, but the woman had a donor card and her family went against her wishes. Her wishes counted for nothing, because they were squeamish and selfish. I understand, but it's the law. If the family don't consent... Ajax reached inside his coat and pulled out his iPad. He opened up an app and turned it to face Wallace. Play it he said. What? Play it. He pushed the iPad at the doctor, giving him little choice. Wallace touched the screen. Ajax watched his face. The two-second clip was without sound. Earlier that day, he'd visited a shop on the corner of Woodston Drive and the A1148, not three hundred metres from where the accident happened. The shop had suffered a series of burglaries and vandalism in recent months, and the shop owner had installed a surveillance camera on the outside wall. It was focused on the shop window rather than the road, but on the rain-soaked Wednesday night, it had captured reflections of cars driving past. You'll see the rear registration number of that silver Mercedes is just about visible, said Ajax. I've frozen it and blown it up, to be certain. To have passed the shop at that hour, a car would have had to drive past the scene of the accident pretty much at the time it happened. If the paint chippings on the victim's handbag match the bodywork of your car, I'd say we have a pretty strong case. Wouldn't you, Mr. Wallace? Wallace didn't speak. His hands on the iPad, though, were noticeably shaking. On the other hand, this is a two-second clip of footage that would be wiped clean soon anyway. Nobody's seen it but me, and if it went missing, which could happen easily, no one would ever know. The case, like so many hit-and-runs, would remain unsolved. What is it you want? Ajax drained his glass. 
I want to talk about my wife. Chapter 119 St. Cuthbert's Golf Club stood on high ground, and on clear days the sea was a slender ribbon of cobalt blue on the horizon. The wind was never still. Ajax watched the silver Mercedes curl its way up the long winding drive and pull into the car park beside his own vehicle. The left front panel was pristine, perfect. From across the car park he saw Patrick climb down out of his defender and walk towards them. Of everyone in his wife's big eccentric family, Patrick was the one he'd found hardest to get used to. Going forward, though, he was going to be the most valuable. Wallace sat staring straight ahead, as though he hadn't seen Ajax. As though the gypsy bloke heading towards him were invisible. Ajax got out of the car as Patrick put his hand on the Mercedes passenger door. In the back, Ajax told him. A moment standoff. Ajax kept his voice low. There'll be a time to unleash the inner psycho. Just not now. Get in the back. With his trademark sullen glare, Patrick did as he was told. At the same time, Ajax opened the passenger door and climbed inside. Wallace didn't bother with social niceties. I've manipulated your wife's data so that she appears to be much more ill than she really is, he said. She really is ill, Ajax said. Moira was on extended sick leave from her job in CID. Without a transplant, she'd never go back. According to her notes, she's unlikely to live beyond another three months, Wallace went on. That will put her very close to the top of the list in terms of urgency. Her youth will count in her favour, as will her previous good health. It's a pity you don't have children, but we have to work with what we've got. Make it one month, said Patrick in the back seat. Wallace shook his head. That would be counterproductive. The database administrators won't believe that someone within weeks of dying will recover sufficiently to make the operation worthwhile. Three months is best. The television appeal will help, too. Ajax had been prepared to call in favours to get BBC Look North to run a TV appeal for more donors from ethnic minorities. But in the event, the programme makers had been surprisingly keen. Moira's colourful family, all of whom were to be involved, would make for good television. Only his wife was reluctant, but the broadcast could hardly go ahead without her. We always get a flurry of sign-ups after a TV appeal, Wallace said. There's really every reason to be optimistic. I'm cutting back my London clinics for the foreseeable future so that I can be on hand. It's not enough, Ajax said. There really is nothing else. Let's talk hypothetically. What does my wife need to live? I'm not sure I... She needs someone from a compatible ethnic group and blood group. Someone who's registered as a donor and whose family will support his or her choice. To die within the next six months. Yes, but it may need more than one. Even with the very particular HLA of Ms. Farr, she may not be at the top of the list. You said before geography is a factor. A donor in the North East would be more likely to benefit Moira than someone in... London, say. That's true. So how many? Impossible to say. And frankly, I really don't... Two? Ten? How many do we have to bring here? How many people have to die before my wife can live? Chapter 120 Friday, the 22nd of September. Busted, said Mojo. 
when Ajax turned the corner and saw the slim figure with the curly dark hair standing at the foot of the grave. Isabel didn't move as they approached. They stopped a foot or so behind her, and saw her raise her torch beam to the wording on the headstone. Moira Joanne Maldonado, nay far, beloved wife, treasured daughter, adored sister. Mojo left his side then and slipped ahead, as though to get a closer look at the woman whom Ajax had been hunting for days. When she turned back to face them both, her hands were resting lightly on the headstone of her own grave. She glanced down, as though to check the wording remained the same, and when she met his eyes again, the spark in them had faded. I'm sorry about your wife, said Isabel, without turning round. I'm sorry about your sister, Ajax replied. Mojo gave a long, heavy sigh, and for a second her outline seemed to blur. Ajax took another pace forward, and he and Isabel stood side by side. Neither looked at the other. He was looking at his wife while he still could. He neither knew nor cared what Isabel was looking at. I understand why you did it in the first place, said Isabel. I might do much the same for someone I loved. But Moira died two years ago. Why are you still doing it? It was a very good question, one his mother-in-law had been asking repeatedly of late. The money was useful, of course, but to suggest any amount of money could make up for what they'd lost was to do Mojo's memory serious disservice. There was some debt, he said. Private medical bills. And I guess we were just... angry. Yes, that was it. So angry when she'd finally slipped away, her body racked with pain and shriveled with disease, that when the boatload of refugees arrived that same night, it was all he could do to stop Patrick ripping them apart with his own hands, because they'd arrived too late. Because in amongst this bunch of filthy, frightened people could be the healthy organ that would have saved his sister. It had taken every ounce of self-control Ajax had not to join in himself, to tear limb from limb, to rip open stomachs, to crush bones beneath his fists. Of course, ultimately, they'd done exactly that. They'd merely contracted the job out to surgeons. So what happens now? Isabel said. I'm guessing you won't want to take the risk of me testifying against you and your wife's family, even if you think I don't have any proof. Did you find Jessica's phone? Ajax said. I imagine you didn't have it to begin with, or we'd have heard from you before now. Directly in front of him, he still hadn't taken his eyes off her. Mojo seemed to be letting the headstone support her weight, as though she were suddenly weary. For the first time his wife's ghost seemed to bear a keen resemblance to his wife in the last few weeks of life. Is the plan to stage an accident for me? Isabel went on. Feed my organs into the system? Add the cash to the Ajax Maldonado Retirement Fund? Mojo's eyes were still fixed on his face, but her body had taken on a translucence. The wall of the churchyard, the line of yew trees, the tall headstones, all things he knew to be behind her seemed to be traced across her body. I've had twenty years of very clean living, Isabel went on, and he wanted to snap at her to shut up that he had other more important things on his mind right now. My organs must be worth something to someone, and it's not as though I care that much. Jessie was the only reason I... No worries. Patrick, unable to keep quiet any longer, appeared from behind the church wall. It'll be my pleasure, 
Pat, pleaded Mojo, but the effort seemed to take a lot out of her. She was fading quickly now. Isabel watched Patrick draw closer. You must have loved your sister very much. Did you ever think that maybe you loved her too much? Ajax couldn't see Isabel's face, but Patrick could, and whatever his brother-in-law saw there made him stop, keep his distance. I had a brother once, Isabel told Patrick. I still have, although I haven't spoken to him for years. He hurt me a long time ago. He loved me, but he hurt me. Maybe he hurt me because he loved me, in his own twisted way. Was it like that for you and Moira? Mojo had taken her attention away from Isabel to look at her brother. There was a look in his wife's eyes that Ajax had never seen before. A mixture of anger and sadness. He'd always wondered if there'd been something not quite right between the two of them. He'd never dared ask. I'll never be able to forgive what he did to me. The frigging nun was still talking about her brother. I thought I'd never bring myself to speak to him again. On the other hand, a great deal about the last few days has surprised me. Okay, enough was enough. I came here to arrest you, Ajax said. I'm sorry I arrived too late. That your grief and your guilt led you to take the most desperate act of ending your own life. Jessica's investigation is recorded on her laptop, and that is in very safe hands, Isabel said. Anything you read on it amounts to nothing but speculation on your sister's part. There's no proof, even if you've found her mobile. I have, said Isabel. That, too, is in a very safe place, but I'm not sure it will be entirely necessary. You see, I've thought a lot about Jessica the last few days. She really was such a wise young woman. Out of everything she said to me over the years, there's one thing I keep coming back to. What's that? Ajax asked. She said to me once, Blood is thicker. What? Isabel looked at Patrick again. You should know all about that, Mr. Farr. The things you were prepared to do for your sister. So ask yourself, what might my brother do for me? She glanced back over her shoulder at Ajax. If, for example, I took the biggest risk of my life and phoned him, just after phoning you. Who the fucking hell is your brother? snapped Patrick. There were footsteps behind, as several figures stepped out from the shadow of the church. Others appeared from behind trees. Ajax caught the gleam of a uniform behind the wall. He turned to see a man he knew walking towards him down the path. That would be me, said Acting Chief Constable John Jones. Ajax Maldonado, I'm arresting you on suspicion of perverting the course of justice, people trafficking, abduction and murder. You do not have to... Out of the corner of his eye, Ajax was aware of uniforms surrounding Patrick, patting him down, reading him his rights. He saw a female officer take hold of Isabel gently around the shoulders and lead her away. All this was on the periphery of his vision. As the chief droned his way to the end of the customary words, Ajax couldn't take his eyes off his wife. She wasn't really there at all any more was nothing more than an impression, like the ripple a stone makes when dropped into water, fading imperceptibly but irreversibly, until there came a moment when it was gone. Chapter 121 Wednesday, the 25th of October John Jones from Wikipedia, the Free Encyclopedia. 
John Edward Jones is a British police officer who is currently acting chief constable of Northumbria Police. Jones was born in 1974 in Stanhope, County Durham. He joined the army at 17 and was attached to the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers until age 20, when the army sponsored him to attend the University of Durham. He gained a B.A. in Philosophy and Politics and later a Diploma in Criminology from the Cambridge Institute of Criminology. Jones's policing career began when he left the army to join Leicestershire Police in the mid-1990s. He spent ten years as a detective, rising to the rank of Detective Inspector before returning to uniform in 2008 and carrying out a number of operational roles with West Yorkshire and Northamptonshire. At Northamptonshire Police, he was Assistant Chief Constable for Specialist Operations and was appointed Deputy Chief Constable in 2012. His position as Chief Constable is expected to be confirmed shortly. In June 2013, he was awarded the Queen's Police Medal. He is married to Sarah and has two teenage daughters. Mother Hildegard removed her spectacles, rubbed her eyes and leaned back from the desktop computer. And you didn't know? Neither of you knew? I don't quite understand it. Jessica was a police officer too. Sitting across the desk in Mother Hildegard's study, Isabel said, There are nearly a 130,000 police officers in England and Wales, and 43 forces. Who can know everyone? John Jones is a common name, and we always called him Ned anyway, because our father was John. No, I don't think Jessica had any idea until she saw him in the police station that night. Hildegard nodded absently. She stared down for a few seconds, and when she looked up again, her eyes were unusually bright. When you joined us, sister, all those years ago, your aunt told us that she thought you'd been harmed. She claimed to have no idea who or how, but I remember distinctly her saying that she thought you were hiding. Isabel looked back at the wise grey eyes then over the elderly woman's shoulder to where rain was beating against the window. Moments passed, and then she knew the time had come. I've been hiding for over twenty years, Mother, Isabel said. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you the truth before. Hildegard put her spectacles back on and seemed to be reading the Wikipedia page again. When she glanced back up, she said, And now you feel you have to meet with him again? To confront him? Not exactly. Maybe. Isabel stopped. She couldn't explain this to herself, never mind anyone else. I don't know. Maybe to prove to myself that I'm not afraid any more? Or maybe I'm doing it for Jessie? Blood is thicker, she said. She knew he'd come through for me. Whatever he did in the past, I wouldn't be here now if he hadn't. Well, thank heaven she was right about that. Hildegard got to her feet. Will you be all right, sister? Would she be all right? She was the sole beneficiary of Jessica's will. She had a car enough money to tide her over until she had a chance to make some decisions. But Hildegard wasn't talking about money. I guess there's only one way to find out, Isabel said. There'll always be a refuge for you here. Even if you do, ultimately, ask to be released from your vows. Thank you. Hildegard turned abruptly to face the window. The glass was streaked with tiny streams of water, 
so it was impossible to tell, especially from across the room, whether the trickles running down the reflection of Hildegard's face were really rain or something else. "'You'll forgive my not showing you out, sister,' she said. "'Somewhat to my surprise, I admit. I think that watching you, of all people, drive away might just break my heart. Chapter 122 The rain had become a torrent by the time Isabel reached Berwick-upon-Tweed, pouring like a punishment from the heaven she'd never believed in. Trees seemed to slump, as though barely strong enough to hold up under the deluge, while the hard road surface beneath the tyres of Jessica's car had dissolved into a rush of water. She spotted the restaurant and pulled up. The rain was now an endless drumbeat. Beating down on the roof of the car, on the street outside, it was drowning out even the roar of her engine, the swish of the wipers, the thumping of her heart. She switched off the ignition, let the water cloud her windscreen, and sat listening. She was twenty minutes early. Indistinctly through the almost opaque car windows, she watched a family run towards the restaurant and race inside. Still the rain came down, as if there were no end to the darkness it had to wash away, until it seemed the flimsy shell of the car around her couldn't possibly hold it off for ever. So many rainy nights in her past, she'd lain awake during heavy rain, wondering if the windows would hold up or if her heart would. Sometimes she'd wondered if he deliberately chose rainy nights, because the incessant battering against the side of the house would cloak what was going on inside it. His groans of pleasure, the silence of her despair. The windows were misting. She wiped a streak clean in time to see a man, his build and speed of movement marking him out as young, stride through the streaming mass of water on the pavement to reach the restaurant. He didn't rush inside, like the family, but stood for several seconds, peering in through the window, looking up and down the street. He checked his watch. He pulled out his phone, seemed to make up his mind, then tugged open the glass door and disappeared. More minutes went by. The news came on the radio a story about a preliminary court hearing in Newcastle that day. Isabel recognised several of the names and turned it off. A car pulled up outside the restaurant. A blue sedan, an unfamiliar make and model, but something about its sleek presence on the street set her heart beating faster. When its driver door opened, she crouched lower in her seat. Ned wasn't wearing uniform. She'd been expecting that he would, had prepared herself for the man in full dress regalia that she'd seen on television that morning in the café. Instead, he had a blue coat over jeans and thick hiking boots. His hair was the same, though, steel grey with a few hints of the dark brown that she remembered. She watched him glance up and down the street, rest his eyes for a second on her car and then go inside. On winter nights at the Priory, the rain had thundered down onto the roof, streaming in mini torrents along the guttering, pouring like tiny ferocious waterfalls to the ground. She'd spent long nights awake there, too, staring at a succession of doors that wouldn't lock, with a cold nugget in her heart that told her in spite of everything that one night he would walk through, that she hadn't escaped after all, that five years, ten years, twenty weren't enough, that there was no escape and that the day would come when he would find her. When she opened the car door, the puddles on the pavement had merged, forming a shallow lake that she had no choice but to step into. He was waiting for her in that restaurant. He'd found her. She was becoming part of the rain. It had soaked through her coat. Her hair was dripping. She could feel rivulets running down the back of her neck. If she stayed out here much longer, she'd dissolve. 
she stepped forward into cold water that soaked her shoes, splashed her way across the road, and pulled open the restaurant door. A group of young women, obviously work colleagues, because they were all in smart suits, were sitting at the bar. The family she'd watched enter were still arguing about which seats the children were going to take. One of them, the youngest, had actually crawled beneath the central table. The eyes that met hers when the door closed weren't those of her brother, who was sitting at a table towards the back of the room, but instead eyes of a deep chocolate brown. The young man at a table by the window had a thin glass of beer in front of him. Most of it was gone already. His hair was dark and curled almost to his shoulders. He looked nineteen, maybe twenty. He was thin, pale-skinned and long-limbed. He was a beautiful boy. And with a stab of pain she saw how much like her sister he was. Bella? The deep voice, still with its northeastern accent, made her start. She hadn't been expecting him to call her that, even though he always used to. She turned away from the young man in the window and faced her brother. He was standing. She took a step towards him. They'd spoken briefly on the night it had all come to an end, but only about immediate events and only in the presence of witnesses. He'd used words like procedure and regularity, insisting she have a family liaison officer with her, and she'd gone along with it all because the last thing she wanted was to talk about anything important or to be alone with him. There was a bottle of wine on the table and two glasses. He was taller than she'd expected, taller than she remembered, and so much broader in the shoulder. But he'd only been eighteen when she'd seen him last. "'Can I take your coat?' he said. Her coat was soaking wet, twice its usual weight and dripping onto the tiled floor. She shook her head. He looked uncertain for a moment before gesturing to the seat opposite his own. She remained standing. Only when he sat down himself did she copy his example. He poured her wine, red. She didn't touch it. I'm sorry about Jess, he said. She was the best of us. Just hearing the name was like a stab in the heart. It was so easy to tell herself it would get better in time. So hard to see her way through the next hour. The first hearing was today, her brother said, changing tack. You may have heard. Magistrates court. Maldonado and five members of the Farr family were remanded in custody pending a trial at the Crown Court. Bail denied. He was buying time, giving her details of the case. Ralph Wallace? she said. It was a good idea. She would do the same. Next couple of days. He'll probably be tried separately. The evidence trail in his case is very different. She already knew the pilot's body had been found, pulled out of a lake not far from where the Farr family lived. The girl we saw being killed, she said. On that first morning. Have you... He interrupted her. A young woman was taken to Newcastle General that same morning. Her family claimed she'd been involved in a climbing accident. Wallace was the harvesting surgeon and her ID does not stack up. She was still alive. While I was running, she was still alive. He leaned forward only fractionally and only for a second. When he saw her pull back, he straightened up again. Bella, you couldn't have saved her. Even if you'd reported what you'd seen, we would never have thought to look in the accident and emergency ward of the local hospital. She was lost once she fell into the hands of those people. She reached out, picked up the glass and put it down again. It had been years since she'd drunk alcohol. It was water she needed. She'd never known her throat to feel so dry but she didn't want to ask him for anything. 
Think of it as communion wine if it helps. Ned was trying to smile at her. Although I have to advise you that drink-driving laws have probably tightened up a lot in the last twenty years. She picked the glass up again and watched the dark red liquid swirl around in it. Communion wine was sipped delicately from a solid silver chalice that always felt ice cold. She could feel the warmth of this wine through the glass. We have, though, this week, rescued a group of people from two locked caravans on a site outside Stirling, her brother told her. They were starving, ill, exhausted, but they'll be okay. They were probably destined for the same fate. That's good. Not that they're ill and starving, that you've found them, and they're okay. His lips widened. Yes, it is. She brought the glass to her mouth. It was nothing like the sweet, watered-down wine the nuns drank at communion. This was rich and smoky, with a texture that seemed to cling to her teeth. She felt its warmth glow in her chest. I know what you think I did, Ned announced. Her hand was trembling as she put the glass down. So they were going to do it now, here, tonight. She wasn't sure she could. I went to see Aunt Brenda when I came out of the army, he went on. She didn't want anything to do with me. Refused to tell me where you or Jessica were. I couldn't understand it. Aunt Brenda, that stout, rough-voiced woman, who'd stepped in and saved her and Jessica when their whole world had fallen apart. She should not have had to deal with. He couldn't understand it. Ned picked up his glass and drank. In spite of what he told her about drink-driving laws, it wasn't his first. The bottle was nearly half empty. I hung around, and that night I saw Uncle Rob in the pub. He told her. He'd had a few, and he picked a fight. He told me what I was supposed to have done. Said he'd string me up if I ever showed me face again. Called me the worst names I could think of, and quite a few I'd never heard before, even after four years in the army. Ned's colour had risen. His hands were shaking. He was struggling with this too. Even so, supposed to have done. Rain pouring down in the pre-dawn. Unbearable pain. A tiny, slime-smeared, solid little body whisked away from her before she could even ask what sex it was. I tracked Jess down a couple of years later, he said. It wasn't hard, once I'd joined the force. I knew she was in the Met. I stood at the back of the church when she got married. Couldn't find a trace of you, though. After a while, I stopped torturing myself. She wasn't listening. Supposed to have done. I had a child, she told him, and felt a surge of emotion that might, just might, be relief at having voiced those words for the very first time. Across the table her brother scowled, and for a second his eyes left hers to look at something behind her. Sixteen years old and pregnant, she said. I don't believe in immaculate conception. Not two thousand years ago and not twenty-four years ago. You did that to me, Ned. And you are not going to pretend it didn't happen. It wasn't me. It was Dad. Nothing. There was nothing in her head. She had nothing to say. She wasn't even sure she'd heard him right. Then... How dare! He held up both hands, as though to ward her off, leaned across the table and spoke low and urgently. She could smell wine on his breath. I didn't know, he said. I swear I didn't. If I'd known, I'd have done something. I don't know what, but I wouldn't have let him do that to you. She leaned forward, too, until their faces were inches apart. It was not Dad. It was you. Think about it, Bella. We were all grieving for ma'am. We were all shattered. 
And then the one person you thought you could rely on started doing that. It was a defense mechanism. You didn't want to believe Dad was capable of something so vile, so you projected what he was doing onto someone else. Not much better, admittedly, but slightly. I was sixteen, fifteen when it started. I knew the difference between my brother and my father. Really? We were the same height, same build, same colouring. A dark room, a terrified girl, really? No. Why do you think the poor bastard topped himself, Bella? He couldn't live with what he'd done. He was not going to do this to her. Nothing he could say would make a difference. I can prove it, he said. How? Ned turned to reach into his coat. He pulled a slim white envelope from an inside pocket. She took it and removed the single strip of paper. Personal Paternity Test Certificate The first line was short, in bold, a case reference number. The second listed a sample number, then the name of the alleged father, John Edward Jones. The third line contained another sample number, then the name of the... Her eyes shot up to meet those of her brother. I know, he told her. Read it. Name of the child. Adam Rupert Townsend. Born 15th of the 10th, 1993. The paper fell from her hands. You've... He... Bella, you need to read it. Most of the page was taken up with a table. Three columns. Letters and numbers. Some sort of comparison going on. It meant nothing. The conclusion will do it, Ned told her. Read the conclusion. Mr. Jones, whilst bearing some similarity of DNA systems, is excluded from being the biological father of Adam Rupert Townsend. The exclusion is based on the fact that he does not show the genetic markers which have to be present for the biological father of the child, Adam Rupert Townsend, at multiple DNA systems. Whilst there is likely to be a close family relationship, it is practically proven that Mr. Jones is not the biological father of Adam Rupert Townsend. The certificate had been signed by two doctors. Everything had changed. The grim certainty she'd carried in her heart for over twenty years had been crushed like black ice beneath a speeding car. And yet there was only one thing that was important. You've seen him. You've met him. He must have done for this to have happened. Bella, do you understand what it says? We did a second test, only on Adam this time. His DNA is particular. Enough to show that he was almost certainly the child of a close... There's no easy way of saying this. Incestuous relationship. His biological father was also his maternal biological grandfather. Adam. His name is Adam. Ned ran a hand through his hair. I did worry about how he'd take the news. Not an easy thing to saddle a kid with. But he's pretty switched on. He said himself, when you're adopted, you know there's something not quite right in your past. Isabel was no longer listening to her brother. She was staring at the name on the paper. Adam Rupert Townsend, born on the 15th of October. It had been pouring with rain, she remembered, just like today. Water had lashed against the hospital windows, streamed along guttering and out through overflow pipes. The world had been full of rushing water the day her son had come into her world. For less than an hour... Behind her, the restaurant door opened, and for a few seconds the sound of the storm outside was amplified. I contacted the adoption agency when I knew it was coming up to eighteen, Ned was saying. I had my details listed on their system, in case he wanted to trace his biological family. There was no one else. Brenda and Rob were dead. Jessica never knew and they had no idea where you'd gone. Adam. Her baby's name was Adam. He got in touch with me. 
Ned told her. He's been part of my family for four years now. But you're the one he's been waiting for. She swallowed. Does he know? Does he know that you found me? Yes, said a voice behind her. A voice she'd never heard before in her life, and yet knew instantly. She turned her head and looked up. The young man from the table by the window, the one with Jessica's eyes, was standing by her side. That is the end of Dead Woman Walking. It was written by Sharon Bolton and read by Julia Barry. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this programme.